thank you for joining us for the Finding Opportunity in Appalachia's Opportunity Zone Learning Session. Hello, I'm Jennifer Simon with the Appalachian Regional Commission. I'm a program manager for business development. Just wanted to give you a few uh, housekeeping items before we get started. You'll, you will receive uh, or see a copy of the slides and the presentation in a few days on ARC.gov on our Opportunity Zones page. If you have questions during the presentation, please be sure that you put those in the box at the bottom of your screen. That's the question and answer box. And we will get to those at the end with a 15 minute session with all of our panelists. Next slide, please. I wanna acknowledge the powerhouse of presenters that we have with us today. Um, we're so fortunate, and while I'm not going to be able to read all of their bios, we have put links to those bios or to their web pages that give you a little bit more information on who we have with us today. So Tim Thomas will be giving us a, a welcome. He was nominated by President Trump in 2018 as their federal co-chairman at the Appalachian Regional Commission. And he has 20 years of experience or more in community uh, infrastructure, workforce training, and regulatory issues. He most recently served on US Senator Mitch McConnell's staff, uh, state staff from 2015 to 2018. Peter Truji is the co-founder of Opportunity Exchange. Peter worked as a management consultant for years prior to moving to Northeast Ohio to work on community and economic development. While there, Peter also helped in selecting or nominating the opportunity zones to Ohio's governor for that region. During that process, he recognized the capacity, the community capacity that needed to be built in order to successfully work on opportunity zones, thus his creation of opportunity exchange. Donna Gambrell was appointed as president and CEO of Appalachian Community Capital in 2017. Previously, Ms. Gambrell served as the director of the U.S. Department of Treasury's Community Development Financial Institutions Fund, or the CDFI Fund. Noelle St. Clair is a Community Development Relationship Manager at Wood Forest National Bank. Previously, she served as Community Development Advisor at the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, where she specialized in community development finance and impact investing. Alex Floxbart is the founder and CEO of Opportunity Alabama. Prior to founding Opal, Alex was a corporate attorney for several years in Birmingham, Alabama, specializing in tax credit and economic development related work. Dr. Jason Jolly is a professor of rural and economic development at, and MPA director, faculty director at Ohio University, Voinovich School of Leadership and Public Affairs. Dr. Jolly directs Ohio University's portion of the Economic Development Administration's University Center. Ross Baird is the founder and CEO of Blueprint Local. He's also the founder of Village Capital, a venture capital firm that has been a pioneer in supporting entrepreneurs worldwide. He's also the author of The Innovation Blind Spot and serves as an innovator in residence with the Ewing Marion Kaufman Foundation. So next slide, please. Let's go ahead and review the agenda. So Federal Co-Chairman Tim Thomas will provide a welcome video. He regrets not being able to join us today. He is traveling. I will review some basic Opportunity Zone concepts and our speakers will go into more detail so that you can get a better sense of the entire program. Peter Truji will be uh, exploring the OZ process for communities based on his experience. Donna Gambrell uh, and Alex Floxbart will provide Appalachian strategies and they are current Appalachian Regional Commission grantees. Dr. Jolly will lead a panel of investors at, where they will talk about the impacts of COVID along with what they are looking for in investments um, in community projects. We will hold all questions to the end, as I said, but please feel free to put those in the Q&A section. So let's hear a few words of welcome from our federal co-chairman, Tim Thomas. Please play the video. Thank you, Jen, and thank you to everyone either participating in or part of the audience for today's webinar. 
we've been very excited by the interest in this program. I think it really shows the enthusiasm that exists in our region for helping communities attract investment they haven't had a chance to access previously. When President Trump signed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act into law back in 2017, which included the statutory authorization for the Opportunity Zones Initiative, he committed fully to the idea that we can do more together to give every community the best chance to succeed. The important tax incentives offered by Opportunity Zones makes community development investments advantageous, and this represents a significant tool for the Appalachian region. While many have seen this initiative as targeted at urban blight, I think leaders from around this region have seen Opportunity Zone designations as a chance to help our rural areas as well. At ARC, we have been focused on ensuring that all communities in our region have the capacity, the resources, and their strategic vision to best position themselves to take advantage of these designations and to attract investment that may have overlooked them before. For the past couple of years, I have had the distinct pleasure of serving on the White House Opportunity and Revitalization Council, or WARC, as it is called for short, that is chaired by Secretary Ben Carson. I have enjoyed the chance to work with Scott Turner, the director of the council, and he has participated in multiple ARC convenings this year, discussing the progress WARC has made in our region. WARC is dedicated to providing tools to communities who feel they can take advantage of an OZ designation. ARC has done its part by funding projects that benefit Opportunity Zones with critical infrastructure improvements, such as expanded high-speed broadband that enables business growth or modern workforce development initiatives to make sure the region has the employees it needs in state-of-the-art advanced manufacturing or other skilled trades ensuring pipelines of skilled workers that are ready to fill in demand, good paying jobs. We have supported state and regional technical assistance programs like Opportunity Appalachia and Opportunity Alabama, who are working directly with communities to develop best practices and bring together investors with projects seeking investment. In 2019, 71% of ARC project funds went to projects that benefited an opportunity zone including 85% of our power initiative funds. These investments are expected to yield thousands of jobs. This is the type of initiative that can transform communities and renew our region. This upcoming year, ARC will devote resources to an important research project that will identify Opportunity Zone success stories and learn what made them successful. The report that comes from that project will not only help policymakers evaluate the program and how it can be enhanced, but will also identify effective strategies that can serve as good models for continued capital raising efforts. Investors are looking for opportunity right now. Some of the changes to the way business is done during COVID will be more or less permanent. And I think people are realizing that geographic location in an urban center isn't essential for modern business. Rural areas with strong quality of life, good business infrastructure, and a skilled workforce stand to benefit, and this can yield development for Opportunity Zone communities. We can capitalize on this shift as a region by ensuring that we have industrial sites with good infrastructure and high-speed connectivity, revitalized downtowns that bring people together, and strong educational opportunities. I'm excited to hear the ideas that come from today's session and from the continued engagement we are having with each other on how to seize the initiative and use this opportunity to advance the region. ARC has been making Opportunity Zones a part of our development strategy for some time now, and we're eager to learn from you on how we can maximize the potential that can result from this effort. Thank you, and now back to the program. Thank you for that, Federal Co-Chair Thomas. So let's go ahead and, and uh, go to the next slide, please. And let's talk about Opportunity Zone basics. So Opportunity Zones were conceived as an innovative approach to spur long-term private sector investments in low-income communities nationwide by unlocking capital gains incentives. Recent estimates suggest that there is upwards of $6 trillion in unrealized capital gains sitting on the books of US taxpayers. So the scope of potential investment 
suggest a promising approach for opportunity for communities and businesses. So the idea emerged as part of the bipartisan investing in, uh, excuse me, investing in Opportunity Act, which was championed by Senators Tim Scott and Cory Booker with a diverse coalition of nearly 100 co-sponsors. In 2017, the legislation was folded into the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. It's important to note that the Opportunity Zone's tax benefit is not funded through federal appropriations or expenditures. Instead, the federal government forgoes tax revenue to incent economic development. Next slide, please. Next slide. Opportunity zones are economically distressed census tracts where new private investments may be eligible for pre preferential tax treatment. Each state's governor is nominated 25% of el eligible tracts. And the Secretary of the US Treasury certified those selections. And they serve as, as our co-chairman mentioned, as opportunity for private investment. Next slide, please. There are over 8,700 Opportunity Zones in the United States, and there are currently 737 Opportunity Zones across the Appalachian region, representing 8.5% of the designated OZs nationwide. Please note that the statute contains no provision to change with community what communities are classified as Opportunity Zones, though that's been talked about by a lot of policy leaders. Next slide. So what are the incentives uh, for, to investors to participate in the program? So the first is a deferral of capital gains taxes. So an investor that reinvests their capital gains within six months of realizing those gains into, uh, and put those into an opportunity fund, they can defer paying federal taxes on those gains until as late as December 31st, 2026. The second, component is a reduction of capital gains taxes. Investors that hold the investment in the Opportunity Fund for at least five years can reduce their tax bill on deferred capital gains by 10%. This reduction re increases to 15% for investors that hold the investments in Opportunity Funds for at least seven years. Third is the elimination of taxes on future gains. Investors that hold the investment and opportunity fund for at least 10 years will not be required to pay federal capital gains taxes on any gains realized from the investment in that opportunity fund. Next slide, please. Opportunity funds are investment vehicles that invest at least 90% of their capital in opportunity zones. Funds can be made up of one investor or a pool of investors. They self-certify with Treasury and are tested twice a year to make sure that they are meeting the 90% test. Opportunity uh, funds can invest in both real estate and in businesses located in opportunity zones. And our speakers will go into more detail about what each of those look like. There are specific requirements for each investment type. So business investments are a little trickier than the real estate investments and Noel St. Clair will address that later in the program. It's also important to note that state and local and federal programs are making additional investments. And again, as the federal co-chairman pointed out, ARC has done that with 75% of our investments in uh, opportunity zones to be able to build up the infrastructure to attract investors. So next slide, please. So a list of Opportunity Zones resources, this is by no means a comprehensive list, but it's one where um, you can dive deeper into the concepts that I have, have talked about. And this list is an excellent resource for you. And please look, uh, I encourage you to look at ARC's uh, map and uh, other resources that we have on our Appalachian Opportunity Zones page. And I also encourage you to look at the at Opportunity Virginia's upcoming virtual workshop series that goes deeper into different aspects of Opportunity Zones program. So now I would like to turn it over to Peter Truji with the Opportunity Exchange to talk about how communities fit into the picture. Peter. Thanks, Jen. Um, good morning, everybody. Thanks to 
everybody who's on the phone and making time to join this webinar this morning. I'm really uh, excited to see the turnout, like almost 200 people, that's awesome. Um, thank you, Jen, and the rest of the ARC team for all the work that y'all have put into to making this, this event possible. Um, super excited to be here with everybody this morning. Uh, as was mentioned, my name is Peter Trug. I'm one of the co-founders of the Opportunity Exchange. We build software to help community and economic development leaders build more equitable and inclusive communities. So when Jen asked me to, to speak this morning, um, she mentioned that you know, when, when folks were signing up for this webinar, there was a question that asked, you know, how much experience or how familiar are you with Opportunity Zones? And, um, which was great to see. There's you know, people who span the whole range, uh, some folks on the phone who are, who are newer to the incentive, uh, maybe approaching it uh, or revisiting it for, for the first time and thinking, you know, how might my community or how might folks that I work with uh, take advantage of, of the incentive and what it could mean for, for our community. We also have folks on the phone who are, are more experienced, um, not only amongst the panelist uh, group, but also uh, in the audience who I'm sure are familiar with the tool um, and have already begun to work with it in your community. So what I'm hoping to cover today is a little bit of background um, from our work, working with uh, communities across the country that will cover two things. One is um, drawing some themes from how we've seen communities across the country organize local opportunity zone strategies. Um, what are some of the common activities that, that we're seeing emerge um, and what does that sort of opportunity zone playbook look like um, at a community level for, for communities that are looking to mobilize uh, and take some proactive steps to, to try to capture some benefits from this incentive. Alongside that, uh, also hoping to offer some, some tactical resources and tools for folks to explore. Um, you know, for those of you who want to take some, some further steps, uh, trying to provide some additional resources, links, um, suggestions of, of, of examples that you and your communities can look to um, if you're looking to go deeper into any one of the different pillars that we talked about here today. So those are the, the what I plan to cover. Um, you know, Jen's introduction was great in terms of providing some overview of the incentive. Um, my goal here is to then break that down a little bit further, talk about how we've seen some communities begin to, to develop strategies against it. And then I think in the conversations that follow, um, as we talk about specific initiatives with Opportunity Alabama, Opportunity Appalachia, and then the investor uh, fireside chat uh, towards the end, I think we'll go into even more detail here. So just trying to set the stage, um, and I'm sure I'll reference a lot of examples from, from folks who'll speaking uh, later in the call. So there'll be some nice uh, give and take here and continuity across the different presentations. Awesome, would you mind advancing to the next slide, please? So quick background here on the Opportunity Exchange. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we build software to help community and economic development leaders uh, build more equitable and inclusive communities. Uh, our team's background, we're based in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, our team's background involves uh, experience working both in community and economic development, as well as civic tech. And so it's that intersection of those two passions that led us to create the Opportunity Exchange um, and, and begin working with a lot of the, actually a lot of the leaders who are on the phone today, um, and then have kind of grown our work more broadly across the country. If you advance to the next slide, we work, we tend to work with uh, organizations that are, um, you know, at a city level, counties, state teams, we work with loan funds. So across the board, we're, we're really looking to develop tools that help integrate um, a lot of the, the common processes that are involved uh, that y'all do every day with a lot of your community economic development work. Um, and to really learn from the partners, uh, some of whom you see here on the slide that we work with to understand uh, new and kind of innovative ways that we can continue to further support their work. So we really see ourselves as side-by-side uh, -side companion for the teams that we work with, um, looking to, to build tools that help facilitate their activities on a day-to-day -day basis, and then learning from them as they go so we can continue to evolve and grow the ways in which we support the communities that we work with. If you go to the next slide. So from all this work that we do, um, you know, we've get to, we're in the privileged position of being able to see and understand a little bit how different communities across the country are taking advantage and starting to build strategies around the Opportunity Zone incentive. What I'll talk through next, if you advance to the next slide, are a couple of the common themes that we've seen emerge um, for different communities across the country. So my hope here, I'll walk through each of these in turn, is to describe a little bit um, for maybe folks who are newer to the space, uh, what is involved with each step 
um, for folks who maybe some of these are familiar with, uh, perhaps there will be steps here that maybe um, you haven't considered or haven't maybe thought of in this way. Um, and then for folks who are super familiar with this, uh, within each step, uh, trying to provide examples and references to either tools that can be helpful um, or organizations that we found to be particularly noteworthy um, in terms of how they're mobilizing strategies against each of these different um, parts of the process. Uh, and again, this isn't sort of anything that is formal. It's just a, a sort of a distillation of themes that we've observed from across our work um, that we're trying to codify and summarize for folks here um, who might be considering similar steps in, their, in your community. So before we go in, the, the five things we'll talk through are first, you know, even before you begin, considering a little bit how you're gonna build sort of a, an initiative locally, how you're gonna organize groups into an ecosystem and how you're gonna build some, some like local commitment and collaboration around the idea of advancing opportunity zone strategy. Second, once you've done that, uh, common next step that we see is, okay, we've done that, we've got people bought in. Let's start to think about how we're gonna identify community needs, community assets and frame those into a community story. Third, we're telling our story. We've got people leaning into the community that we're supporting. Uh, next thing is we've got to figure out which properties are, are, are available that might be uh, strategic priorities, could be catalysts for development in our community. And you want to understand what projects might be in the works already or um, sort of ideating in people's heads that might be a good fit uh, for, for the incentive. Fourth, with that list of projects, each one's going to need some assistance as it thinks about its go-to-market strategy. So uh, I can share some examples of how we've seen that be, uh, be addressed by different communities. And then last, as, as groups go to market, there's a role for, for cities and states uh, to play uh, as they think about how they can help facilitate connections and support projects um, on their path to, to market. So those are the five steps we'll talk through um, in the next 10 minutes or so here, uh, and we can get going. So if you advance to the next slide, one of the first steps here is mobilizing organizations that you work with in your community um, into a, sort of a, an ecosystem and starting to build an idea of, you know, how are we going to compel and convince groups that we work with to, to work alongside us in pursuit of the of this strategy. Um, you can see here an example slide uh, from uh, Alex will be speaking next uh, of a depiction of how they think about uh, their, their local ecosystem. Right, but in in summary, a lot of the ways in which communities uh, think about organizing this is you need to build a collaboration that involves uh, community leaders, uh, project sponsors in your community, potential investors, and other sources of capital, and then institutional anchors who uh, can help support and galvanize um, and provide resources to the effort that's taking shape. In many cases, uh, I think as some of the the speakers um, who who will follow me will will, will exemplify. Um, there's often sort of a lead organization um, who is really the catalyst in helping to develop um, this ecosystem and raising their hand to say, hey, we'll take the charge here, um, you know, and create, create uh, the space uh, and be the convener for other groups to come around. Um, in other cases, and again, uh, and when the slides are distributed, these links will be accessible to y'all. Um, in other cases, we see a, see a collaborative effort where um, there's a number of organizations that come together across the community. You know, our work in Cleveland is an example of this, where there's uh, the local chamber of commerce, the city, the county, the local land bank, a local philanthropic organization um, have together collaborated to create uh, and build this opportunity zone ecosystem here in Cleveland. So I think that's one of the first questions is sort of what, who, who will convene um, and who's in a role to, to do that in your community. Second, I think, is thinking about the scope. A lot of, in the early days of the incentive, we saw a lot of organizations take on sort of an opportunity zone specific lens. We're gonna build this ecosystem in support of advancing an opportunity zone strategy for our community. Recently, we've seen those strategies begin to evolve to by no means leave opportunity zones behind, but think about, all right, well, what other priorities do we now have uh, given uh, the, the pandemic and thinking about recovery and how we, we rebuild some of this? Uh, might there be opportunities to frame uh, sort of a community strategy that can build community buy-in and get commitment from local organizations around an initiative that not only supports opportunity zones, but maybe has a broader lens? So I think that's the second point here, sort of what will be the scope and what will be the frame through which um, you build local collaboration? Um, lastly, just thinking about then once sort of you have those, those approaches developed, uh, kind of what's the cadence and structure by which uh, folks will be convened? And this is not particularly glamorous work, I recognize, but um, thinking about the, the groups that we work with, 
this is one of the common success factors that we see be really indicative of sort of the longevity and impact of some of the initiatives that are happening across the country is groups that have really put the time into thinking through some of this initial step um, really, really, really can make a big difference for their community. Um, and so while it might not be the most glamorous, uh, I think it's really important to call out at the beginning. If you go to the next slide, the next step here that we commonly see is um, as you kind of identify the actors in your community who are positioned to lead is beginning to identify community needs and assets. Uh, for folks who are maybe more familiar with the Opportunity Zone space or on the phone, um, this really looks a lot like um, a lot of the community prospectuses that you might be familiar with um, that have come out over the course of the past couple of years. Um, you know, the, the goal here is really to, to create and help, help tell a story for your community that um, really shares and describes the vision for where you want to, to, to go, uh, either as a city, as a neighborhood, as a county, as a region. Um, these tend to involve, uh, you know, thinking about what assets exist in your community, what things can you build around. You have common anchor institutions that are really strong assets and could be the, the catalyst for or the anchor for for storing future growth. Um, what needs exist? How might you frame those needs in a way that could be compelling to somebody who um, is looking to maybe build a project or, or lead a development effort in your community? Um, some of the best practices that we've seen here are to think, you know, a lot of this work exists in a fragmented sense. Um, you know, if you're looking at this, or maybe you've seen some of these prospectuses and you're just scratching your head saying, wow, this looks, seems like so much work. Um, a lot of times we've seen communities be able to leverage other strategy documents that they've already com compiled to, to kind of uh, help provide some helpful input to developing this opportunity zone perspective. Um, so I think I'd encourage folks who, who are curious about this, but eager maybe to say, how, how might we do this effectively now? think about what resources maybe you've already developed that could be helpful. Some other best practices that we've seen are, you know, in order to have this be authentic and sort of really uh, can become a rallying document for the community that you're serving, it's important to think about how you solicit input from folks um, to, to build that buy-in. Um, and then at the end, the idea here is really to have a compiled document, whether it's a, a Opportunity Zone Perspectives PDF, like the screenshot you see here from, you know, Pittsburgh, uh, or um, we've built a tool on Opportunity Exchange to help facilitate some of this activity that you know you can share sort of a community vision. I think the, the end goal here is to have a, a shareable document that really compiles the, the vision um, and sort of that, that initial pitch for your community that you can, you can share. I've linked here at the bottom, if you're gonna go back and look for some resources, to some really helpful guides that have been put together around how to build some of these documents um, for folks who are curious. If you go to the next slide. All right, so now what we've done is we've kind of built some local momentum. We've started to tell our community story. One of the next common steps that we see is, all right, well, now we need to think about what we would actually show somebody who might be interested. Um, this is where you start to build a pipeline of projects that, that um, uh, may be underway or might have been discussed in your community and available properties that could be the catalyst for, for, for development or for you know, a storefront for a small business. Um, there's a lot of the different examples of how this can be done. Uh, I've shared here an example from you know, Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, they have a great website where they've uh, listed some projects that are ongoing in their community um, and have started to codify that. Um, we've got tools on Opportunity Exchange to help with this process. I think the idea here is that you, um, you can see it on, some, on the left here, some of the, the best practices that we've seen are thinking about from the property side, you know, are there publicly, publicly held properties that could be in a strategic location um, for some of your, your longer term community plans that might be interesting targets for development. Um, other developers maybe you've worked with in the past or who you're familiar with that are active in the community that you might be able to understand sort of what are their plans and do they have projects in the work. And ultimately the goal here is to really start to aggregate, prioritize and track this pipeline um, so that there be, can become a little bit more of a, a regular rolling inventory of, of projects and opportunities that could be prioritized and worked on um, for, for your community. And so that this doesn't have to be cobbled together sort of every time maybe somebody says, hey, what do you have available? Um, the idea here is to, to, to standardize and really work on this in a more regular basis so that that prioritization um, can occur uh, sort of on an ongoing basis. If you go to the next slide, being mindful of time here. Um, the next step here is, all right, so now we have a list of things that might be useful assets in our community. Um, how do we think about what's needed to help get these projects or properties to market? There's a lot that goes into this process. Uh, and it's quite, it can be quite complicated. So I've tried to distill and summarize some key themes here 
but recognize that this is by no means a, a, a comprehensive list. Some of what we've seen be successful here are a couple of things. You can see them on the left, some of which will be highlighted as we go through. One is simply thinking about what is a, a checklist that you might want to have for a project sponsor um, to say, hey, I'm looking to do this project in the zone. Uh, here is the types of information about my project that I know that I will need to have in order to credibly talk to uh, an investor. Um, we've seen that be a helpful tip that communities have pulled together and a really helpful resource for some sponsors in their community. Second is thinking about tools to help projects uh, consider um, and evaluate their financial viability. This is a common challenge that we see folks addressing, which is I have an idea for what might be great on this property, but uh, I don't know anything about how the financials might work. I've linked here to a free tool called Ground Up that was developed by the Governance Project in partnership with MasterCard, uh, which is meant to really help facilitate this modeling process. Um, it will be released uh, later this week. So if you like, the link here will take you to a sign-up page where you can be notified when it is uh, available. If you go to the next slide, the third bullet point here is around helping projects convey some of their community impact. This is a big part of the process. It's uh, helpful for building community momentum around projects, of course. It's also helpful for thinking about how to attract impact-motivated capital. Um, there is a great tool that the Urban Institute has developed called the Community Impact Assessment Tool, which is a very helpful framework for thinking about how to evaluate project level impact for anything that's going on in your community. Lastly, if you go to the next slide, there are some really, really great examples. Uh, since you know what I've covered here is only a, a portion of what uh, all the different projects will need, there are some great examples that I've linked to here of other ways to provide assistance to projects as they navigate the development pathway um, that might be interesting to, to spur some creative brainstorming in your community. Cool. Last component, if you go to the final slide here, um, is around then thinking about how to facilitate connections. Uh, there's a whole bunch that goes into this. I'll share a couple of best practices here, but I imagine that the folks who speak next will also speak a lot to this point. You know, think about what types of investors and what types of capital might be interested in your community's projects. Of course, this is an Opportunity Zone webinar, so Opportunity Zone investors um, might be a great fit for some of the projects in your community, but increasingly we're seeing folks not limit themselves just to that segment, but also thinking, are there lenders that might be actually a better a better fit for the projects that we have? Are there uh, local non-opportunity zone investors that might be interested? Are there federal resources or grants that might be able to help some of the projects move forward? Um, thinking about what those types of investors are and what specific outreach strategies to each might be is that sort of this tail end of the process um, as you then think about, all right, we've got some quality things going on in our community. We can tell our story really concisely. Um, how do we start to get the word out about what we're doing? Great. I think that that is the um, right on time. I think that's the final kind of component of the process that I was hoping to speak to this morning. So just to recap, I think what we've gone through is the sort of different steps that we've seen emerge from across our work, um, supporting efforts uh, all over the US, uh, trying to provide an overview of sort of what that entails, as well as resources if you're interested to learn more or maybe think about how this could fit in your community, um, provide some resources to help maybe get you started for some further exploration. Um, I know there's time for questions at the end, so with that, I'll conclude, um, and I would like to introduce Alex Foxbart of Opportunity Alabama, uh, one of our best, most awesome, energetic partners doing really cool work. Um, I'll introduce him and Donna Gambrell of Opportunity Appalachia, another one of our partners who's super excited about the work they're doing in ARC communities. Um, introduce both of you and turn the floor over. Uh, thanks, everybody, for your, for your time this morning. Thanks so much, Peter. Uh, it is always good to hear Peter uh, just talk about how awesome opportunity is. He's been one of our greatest partners from day one. Um, and it's been it's been fun to kind of build this infrastructure out with him. Quick reminder for everyone. Uh, if you have questions on anything that we're talking about, please drop them in the in the Q&A box. Um, I see a whole bunch coming in already, which is great. So keep it coming. And I'm sure that you will be left with more questions than answers after after I'm done. And Donna will clear them all up, hopefully. Um, so I'm Alex Floxpart from Opportunity Alabama. Um, we, as you know, you've heard Peter talk about, and you, as you can see on the slide, we're the uh, Alabama's statewide response to Opportunity Zones. Um, we, I think, similar to many of, of y'all, uh, have a historically underdeveloped access to capital infrastructure for Alabama's low-income places. Um, and uh, we have been... Uh, we, we've really used opportunity zones as an excuse to start a conversation around what ecosystem building looks like 
on a statewide basis to facilitate access to capital for those low income places. And it's been really interesting to see to, to, to a theme that both Peter and, and Jen alluded to earlier, how that has changed, like how the Opportunity Zones tool has really kind of morphed into uh, a broader conversation with the same folks that we've been talking to for the last two years about what reinvestment in our communities looks like, whether it's via the strict Opportunity Zones vehicle or not. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, please. Um, great. This is what we do at Opal. We have three big pillars. Uh, one, work with communities. Two, work on building out a project pipeline on a statewide basis. And three, facilitating access to capital. And we have programming built out around each one of those that we'll talk about here in a minute. But our whole vision on Opportunity Zones is that the only way to, in a program that does not legislatively, to, to, which to us is a good thing, by the way, um, you know, the, the sort of open-ended nature of Opportunity Zones can either lead to uh, folks, you know, sort of just doing whatever they want to do using the OZs as a tool for doing so, or it can lead to the kinds of comprehensive community-oriented conversations that all of us on this webinar want to see happen, right? And it's up to us as local organizers to make the latter happen so that we don't get caught off guard by the former. Um, and so in our network, within the projects that we work on, our core theme around working with communities, around building out a project pipeline, around facilitating access to capital is what is the impact of every project in our pipeline? And happy to talk more in the Q&A about what some of those impact metrics are. Although if you're looking, I would strongly commend you to um, some cool stuff that Peter's uh, hopefully soon gonna be rolling out on his platform, some work that the Urban Institute has done uh, on their OZ uh, scorecard and some additional work uh, that uh, the Beck Center uh, and others put together on a broader OZ impact oriented framework. So um, let's next slide, please. Great. So this is the, the first piece of what we do at Opportunity Alabama. It is, you know, bucket one, working with communities. We do two big categories of community-oriented work. One is working in urban areas, uh, and that is helping local economic development officials in places like Birmingham and Huntsville, uh, and even smaller metros like Tuscaloosa, identify what their neighborhood-based, neighborhood-to-neighborhood oriented economic development vision looks like. Uh, is it mixed-use commercial? Is it grocery stores? Is it uh, new small businesses, you know, what is it? And then helping them kind of build backwards into using OZs as a tool to facilitate that. Uh, in rural areas, what we found was it's, it's, it's projects or the things that a lot of our rural community organizers called projects were sort of, as Peter alluded to, um, not necessarily fully baked projects. And so you'll hear Donna talk more about this, but uh, what we've done is put together a curriculum comprehensive framework called the Rural Recovery Accelerator that we've used as a, uh, effectively what it is, is it's, it's targeted technical assistance. It's targeted intensive technical assistance where we spend eight to 12 weeks with um, a, a handful of six rural communities at once and work with each of those communities to identify somewhere between two and five projects and then just scale the heck out of them, right? So, and, and these projects look different from community to community. In some places that looks like grocery, in some places that looks like you know, additional airport hangar space for, uh, for light industrial in some places that looks like, uh, re, you know, revitalizing a building on a downtown square for ground floor retail and second store lofts. In some cases it even looks like broadband. So it, it looks totally different depending upon the circumstance, but our goal is working with each of our rural communities to not just work on all their projects, not build out some, you know, 20 page comprehensive plan that lives on a shelf, but to say, hey, take the sum total of all the work you've done over the last 10, 15 years on economic development, and then find the two most, three most executable private investment oriented projects that we can actually get off the ground. And for those of you guys saw a question come in on the chat, like what do OZ investors actually look for? That's the key with these deals. You actually, I mean, if there isn't a way to create a return out of the project, then it's really not a great project to view. It's, it's, it's not the, the project that you want to use for the OZ tool in your toolkit, right? Um, so that's what we've been working on is, is, is how do you actually structure a comprehensive target, targeted technical assistance effort around that. And what's happened through that targeted technical assistance effort is we've actually wound up finding that it is just as effective in an opportunity zone as not in an opportunity zone. Because the same, it's, at the end of the day, investors, banks, capital providers want to see the same stuff. They want to see pro formas vetted, demand studies, vetted, marketing materials, comprehensively put together and aligned with local, you know, 10-year planning, right? Uh, they want to see a local network and local letters of support. So 
you know, and, and that's true of OZ deals or not OZ deals. So um, we've actually wound up because of the state's collective response to COVID and because we've had sort of like our arms in each of Alabama's 67 counties, thanks to the fact that we have an opportunity zone in each, um, so being a little bit at the tip of the spear for just broader economic revitalization and recovery work through COVID um, and are now working with a broad coalition, including our state's you know, industrial, statewide industrial sort of development organization, EDPA, the Business Council of Alabama, Alabama Small Business Development Center and others to sort of like franchise this programming and, and, and take it statewide so that we can be helpful to all of our communities and not just our OZs. Next slide, please. Um, so project pipeline is step two. Obviously we're helping to cultivate that in rural places through rural recovery accelerator, but we also get plenty in urban places. Um, this to the point earlier, most of what we're looking at, again, are projects that are going to produce some rate of return for impact oriented. And well, I'll talk about that on the next slide. But, uh, you know, we do a few things here, targeted technical assistance to help projects identify how they can take advantage of OZs, uh, uh, structuring work. But most importantly, it's impact improvement work. So it's taking projects that come to us, say, in an urban area adjacent to a university, um, you know, and, and say, look, guys, you know, this university has got a minority scholarships uh, program for, for students that does not include uh, room and board. Is there a way that you student housing development could uh, work in some beds for, uh, for, for, for those students on scholarship programs, et cetera, right? Like it's helping to find the individual impact of projects, work with those projects to, in exchange for access to capital and technical assistance, making their impact profile deeper. Next slide, please. Um, and then, so here's some examples. I can send you the deck afterwards, but we've done some really fun stuff. Uh, probably one of the coolest ones we've done so far is a project over in Heflin, Alabama, a $12 million senior care facility that's revitalized an old high school in a town of 5,000 people. Uh, it's, it, this, there's folks starting to move, move into this now, and it's pretty cool. Some of the tenants for the, for the building were actually graduates of the high school back in the 60s and 70s. So it's, been, it's, it's kind of cool to see a full, full, full circle cycle of life in a rural community come back around. Uh, keep going, next slide. Um, uh, and then finally, this is our access to capital piece. So this is our third leg of the stool. This is the leg of the stool that makes the other two legs of the stool work, right? Because unless you know, you can rely on the kind of network that we have. Uh, it, you, you can't extract concessions from project sponsors on impact. Uh, you can't wind up plugging people into rural capital networks. And it's been very interesting to build out this network. I mean, it, it's comprised of everyone from, you know, Ross Baird uh, and, and the Wood Forest Bank folks that you'll hear from here in just a little bit, who are just absolutely incredible human beings and have done so much for the impact investing space, um, all the way down to you know, uh, to, to local individuals that have had capital gain events that want to participate in projects that are getting teed up through rural recovery accelerator. So the broader the network, the better. Um, and, and I know that we're running short of time, so let's just keep moving here. Uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, this is kind of the next leg of the stool is, uh, I think I'll leave this to Ross to talk about later, but uh, we're, we're, we're building out a very interesting partnership that we think can kind of be the next, the, the next chapter of our access to capital work involving creating our own controlled uh, opportunity zone vehicle to, to do some of our own investing, just because the introduction, introduction, introduction game, uh, while, while it's helped to get about 125 million worth of projects done so far, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a slow go uh, and having our own capital makes a huge difference for that. So uh, keep, I think that's all we have for slides. Um, would love to turn it over at this point to Donna Gambrell, who uh, is really like you heard about rural recovery seller. She and her work is the inspiration for that. And she's uh, done some absolutely incredible things in this space, including winning some cool recognition from Forbes and everything else. So Donna, take it away. Thank you, Alex. And it's uh, always a pleasure to see you, even though it's virtually. Hope to see you in person real soon. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, again, just a pleasure to be on the panel with so many distinguished colleagues. I wanna thank ARC for hosting this webinar today and, and certainly uh, to Jen Simon and her team for all the support that they have provided uh, to Opportunity Appalachia uh, and to a number of the panelists today as well. I'm gonna just uh, start off by uh, giving you a real quick snapshot of Opportunity Appalachia. And I'm not gonna go over a lot uh, that has already been said, but you know, so much uh, of the projects that we're all working on, the key is collaboration. And um, that is certainly a, you know, the, the way I would describe Opportunity Appalachia. Next slide, please. Uh, so when we started this, this uh, initiative, uh, there was a lot of discussion uh, when the 
legislation first came out about whether or not there would even be a place for rural communities. What did we really want to try to achieve? Did we really have the kind of projects? Uh, we certainly didn't have the multi-billion dollar deals that folks were seeing in urban markets. Uh, and, and for many in rural communities, we thought we were at a real disadvantage because there were fewer resources uh, to, to enable us to develop the community strategies. Um, we didn't always have the um, expertise that was needed to uh, make our, our projects even more attractive to investors, both local and national. And so one of the things that Opportunity Appalachia was really focused on at the very, very beginning was getting a great sense of the community needs. What did the community want? Um, where were their priorities? What were some of the projects that they had already identified? And they may not have been large projects, but they were ones that were going to really transform communities. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we wanted to do, uh, and you saw the map before that, we actually uh, chose 150, looked at 158 opportunity zones in three states, West Virginia, uh, Virginia, and Ohio. Uh, in central Appalachia, those are the hardest hit in many cases, uh, places in the region. And we said, let's look at the vision. What do we really want to do? Well, first of all, we wanted to have impact. We really wanted to look at ways in which we could bring jobs and business support and investment to some of the hard hit rural communities in Appalachia. We wanted to build new and or, or strengthen current partnerships. And you'll see that in the way that uh, Opportunity Appalachia is structured, that that is exactly what has happened. Uh, our partners are, again, just extraordinary. Uh, at the local level, we have worked with and are continue to work with uh, Southwest Opportunity Southwest Virginia, Southeast Ohio, as well as the West Virginia Hub uh, at the state level. These uh, three organizations and three collaboratives really formed the basis for a steering committee. We started out that way and said, you know what, in order for this to work, it has to be the people in the community lending voice uh, to the projects, lending voice to the priorities as well. And so those um, organizations have been just extraordinary in the work they have done. They do the heavy lifting every day. We also thought it would be helpful to have national partners as well. So we worked with Main Street America, as well as Coastal Enterprises, which is a, a rural CDFI located in Maine with 40 years of experience in community development. Uh, and they offered, uh, both of those entities offered to serve as technical advisors if in fact the local communities wanted them to play that role. Um, so the partnership itself has just been critical to the success of this initiative. Um, the fourth part, point that we wanted to, to really focus on is that we wanted to be sure that we were being inclusive. And really, what did that mean? That meant that we were looking at all parts of the community. We were looking at all types of partners uh, to be, in par uh, be a part of this effort, whether it was you know, economic development agencies, uh, business developers, community leaders, and others. We certainly wanted to make sure that in communities where there was racial diversity, that we were reaching out. Um, to uh, people who had an interest, whether it was from a business uh, perspective or from a community uh, residence perspective as well, to really get a good understanding of what um, the needs were. And we continue to do that. Um, sometimes it's a bit challenging, especially in this virtual environment that we're in today, but we really felt that it was really important to, to continue to talk about the importance of equity in, in our work. Next slide, please. So the uh, anticipated outcomes, when we brought everybody together, one of the things that we wanted to um, conclude with, and this is really like a pilot for us, we wanted to start with those three states and those uh, specific communities, but we said at the end of the day, uh, the anticipated outcomes would be that we would have selected 15 to 20 uh, opportunity zone communities in central Appalachia, and that we would serve as kind of the technical assistance matchmaker, if you will. Because what the communities were saying, again, is that we need help in developing prospectuses or writing pitch decks or architectural design firms to help us with, with our projects or accountants, lawyers, or other types of specialized assist, uh, assistance uh, on the projects. And so we want to be sure that we were matching 
the projects, once we identified them uh, with the help of the community, match them with the right technical assistance providers. Uh, and again, making sure that those projects were very diversified in terms of manufacturing, health, education, tourism, and recreation, downtown development, uh, and food systems. Once the prospectuses were complete, uh, our uh, goal is to reach out uh, to opportunity fund investors, both local and national. And we're planning to do that in the first quarter of 2021 and bring those investors uh, you know, up close and personal to the projects themselves. And again, we were planning to do this in person uh, and had plans to do so before COVID-19. We're now going to do it virtually, uh, which is, presents whole new opportunities, but also challenges in and of itself. But again, I think it'll be a great opportunity because we have been uh, talking with and working with uh, a number of uh, qualified opportunity funds over this past year. Uh, our outreach initially was to over 25. Um, a number of these funds actually provided letters of support when we submitted a TA application to the Appalachian Regional Commission. And it's through the Appalachian uh, Regional Commission that we actually received the grant to help with the technical assistance. The other thing that we wanted to do is uh, in terms of the outcome, we hope to bring about $235 million of new opportunity fund capital to these targeted opportunity zone communities, which we um, are again, are aiming to uh, create uh, over 1800 jobs. Next slide, please. So I'm not gonna go over um, all of the uh, projects. Uh, at the end of the day, about 54 applications were submitted. Uh, the steering committee winnowed those down, whittled those down to about 16 uh, applications that were accepted. Uh, again, a very thorough, methodical process by the steering committee made up of the organizations that I talked about earlier. Uh, and they looked over very carefully uh, in terms of location, uh, impact, all of the criteria that we were looking for initially. Uh, and so in Ohio, uh, again, in each of the states, we have at a minimum five uh, projects and, in, and at least uh, six projects in one state uh, to add up to 16 projects altogether. Uh, but in Ohio, we have a $4 million redevelopment for example, of um, the canal warehouse restoration. Uh, this is 25,000 square foot uh, historic uh, downtown Ohio and Erie Canal warehouse. It's going to be repurposed uh, into a mixed use retail space as well as space for living and workspace. And we're really excited about that. Uh, another. Um, project in Ohio is at 20 Federal uh, Place in Youngstown. There is really strong interest in that project from the National Trust Community Investment Corporation, which is a national um, organization. That's a $50 million, $50, million redevelopment of 300 thousand square foot uh, historic downtown retail site. In Virginia, uh, we have the uh, Virginia uh, Warehouse Development and Virginia Avenue Boutique Hotel. This is two projects being done by one developer. Uh, and again, very excited about uh, the possibilities there. In fact, I think I saw on the site for the Virginia Avenue Boutique Hotel, they were actually asking for uh, continued community uh, input. You can actually uh, go on site and talk about, you know, what that will actually do in terms terms of revitalizing, helping to revitalize community, the community itself and surrounding space. Um, we also have uh, in Virginia a project um, called Micronic. Uh, this is a $7 million high growth award winning tech company. And actually they just closed on an opportunity uh, zone investment this week. So that means that there's already this interest long even before we do our, our convening that uh, there are investors already looking at projects uh, in the space that we have carved out. And initially, and in West Virginia, we have um, Thundercloud uh, Incorporated. This is a, a $9 million fiber network and data center that's operated by a local nonprofit with uh, support of leading community institutions. And also in West Virginia, we've got um, the Cohen Building that's in Grafton. It's a $9.3 million redevelopment of a historic downtown building, and it will be used by identified pro for profit and nonprofit 
tenants. So I could go on and on. I think all of us could probably talk all day about the projects because I think we're really excited. But I think what Opportunity Appalachia is most excited about is that this matching seems to have been successful to date. Uh, and we're just excited about presenting this uh, a whole platform to the investors in the first quarter. Um, we could not have done this again without the support of ARC and with the Benedim Foundation that also provided uh, support for us as well. And so as we go down this road, go down this journey, I mean, I think it's again been critical to make sure that we have good uh, community partners with us, uh, and certainly community partners with a very much of a strategic vision of how they want to see their community transformed. Um, next slide, please. And so I wanted to, do, again, just thank you everybody today for taking the time. Uh, I'm running out of time, I can see right now. So we, I know we want to have some time set aside as well, not only for our next speakers, but for some Q&A if there's an opportunity to do so. So now, I'd like to introduce Jason Jolly of Ohio University's Voinovich School, and he's going to be joined with his fellow panelists, Noel St. Clair of Woodforce National Bank and Ross Baird of Blueprint Local. Thank you so much. Thank you, Donna. Uh, uh, Noel and Ross, I'll let you all turn on your cameras and, uh, and your mics. Uh, we are a little bit behind and we'll do our best here uh, to get uh, a little bit caught up. So I'll, I'll try to move as quickly as I can. I'm pleased to have uh, Noel and, and Ross here uh, for this uh, fireside chat. So we do not have uh, any PowerPoints. We're just going to go through and have a conversation. Uh, I jotted down uh, five or six questions and I may combine a few to help us get through this a little bit more quickly. But let's maybe get right to it, uh, Noel and Ross. One of the things we've heard consistently throughout this webinar today is a discussion about how COVID-19 uh, is impacting everyone. And how do you see COVID-19 impacting opportunities on investment and, and project development? And maybe, Noel, you can go first and then we'll kick it over to Ross. Great, thank you, Jason. And, and thank you again to the webinar organizers for having us all here and inviting Woodfarts to be a part of this. Um, Woodfarce has been involved in the Opportunity Zone uh, space since last August when we had a large capital gains event and saw it as an opportunity to really grow our CRA investment portfolio. So all of the um, Opportunity Zone activity we're doing is really in line with Community Reinvestment Act eligibility criteria. Um, we were off to a, a strong start when the pandemic hit um, and though it hasn't slowed us down um, as much as one might anticipate, we did as a bank have to kind of, kind of take a step back and be heads down um, on PPP for a while. We were able to deploy PPP loans to both existing customers, but also new customers. Um, and so a lot of new strategic initiatives had to be put on pause. But we were in the process of rolling out a $20 million fund in partnership with CEI Bolus Capital Management. Um, they are a joint venture of the Community Development Financial Institution, Coastal Enterprises, uh, CCML, their new market tax credit subsidiary that you heard Donna talk about. They've been investing in rural areas for decades um, and the Bolus Company, which is a commercial real estate development firm. So we had already invested $20 million with them. Um, as Ross could speak to, the IRS did give some extensions to investments that were already in qualified opportunity funds. So instead of deploying them by June, uh, we now have until December. And we've just been impressed by our fund managers, both CEI Bullets Capital Management and also Ross at Blueprint. Woodfarts is pleased to be an investor in their fund as well. Um, just being creative about how to make these projects come to fruition despite this challenging macro macroeconomic environment. So just one example I'll give before turning it over to Ross is that we're working on a project in New Orleans the bank financing, the debt was in place, and then COVID hit and, you know, banks' risk appetite changed dramatically. Our fund managers were able to be proactive to bring together a CDFI consortium so the community development financial institutions are filling that debt gap. Um, so I think it just takes a little bit of creativity, but that's why it's promising to hear all the expertise of the people on the webinar who are committed to make these projects happen despite the challenging environment we find ourselves in. Thank you, Noel. Ross, you want to give us some your thoughts? Yeah, first first of all, um, thanks uh, to ARC for hosting us. It's great to be here. Great to be here with um, 
some uh, wonderful partners, um, Alex and Opportunity Alabama, we at Blueprint are working with to, to build some of these strategies in Alabama. Um, and Noel is, is both an investor and champion of our fund at Blueprint and also sits on our advisory board. Um, and so it's, it's great to um, be on this panel with some, some collaborators uh, that, that I really respect and admire. So thanks for having us. Um, yeah, I mean, I would say that in a lot of ways, um, COVID has created headwinds and tailwinds in the opportunities that we're looking at. I think the headwinds are um, on the capital side, um, both opportunity zone equity investors as well as banks lenders have become um, a lot more conservative. Um, some projects um, are largely proceeding as planned, but a lot of projects have been put on pause just for lack of access to capital. So I think um, it's a lot of the areas that we're investing uh, struggled to access capital even pre-COVID in, in an economy that seemed pretty good, um, and 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 the flow of capital stopped. So I think it, I think it's a really important time to redouble our efforts and, and focus on on the communities that we care about. Um, I think the other big headwind, you know, Noel talked about PPP and Wood Forest's investment in small businesses. Um, I think the um, you know the stock market is continuing to look good, uh, but the reality on the ground is is the local businesses and the places where we're um, investing have, have been devastated in many of the communities of, of, of people on this call. And so um, I think, and I know you're going to ask about this later, I think investing and operating businesses uh, with opportunities and capital was was complicated pre-COVID. And it's become a lot more complicated because of just how difficult the small business environment is in our country. So that's something that's top of mind. So those are, those are headwinds. Um, I would say tailwinds are um, with a lot of, so I'd say at the 30,000 foot level, it's kind of been discouraging, but then at the one foot level on the ground, I think the tailwinds are, it's really, um, it's really reshuffled the deck um, in a very positive way. And it's caused a number of project developers, organizers, institutions to think differently around investing in distressed communities. And we're, we're seeing things come to life that we we would not have anticipated um, pre-COVID. So for example, um, in, and I know this isn't within the ARC's catchment area, but a lot of the um, a lot of the cities that we've been looking at in Appalachia or with, within the ARC region, whether it's um, you know, Charlottesville or Winchester or Roanoke Blacksburg in Virginia or Greenville, South Carolina or Northern Alabama with, with Alex and Opportunity Alabama, there's there's a huge need for um, to support food and agriculture, um, food and agriculture entrepreneurs. Um, and we've been looking at that as a theme in a number of our investments. Um, we made an investment um, earlier this year post COVID in Richmond, um, where is a um, mixed income workforce housing uh, multifamily uh, development, and it had a ground floor retail center. And pre COVID, the plan was just to go out and, and find any old tenant that would 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 be bankable and be lendable. Um, we found post COVID that the banks would still lend to the workforce housing component of the project, but they wouldn't lend to the office or retail, just being afraid of office and retail as a sector. Um, so we actually were able to bring about six million in opportunity zone equity to replace the the bank loan that would have gone on that that sector. Now, the fact that we were able to, to finance that with opportunity zone equity, which is 10 year patient capital, actually opened up a lot of opportunities to have greater impact with that space. Um, in Richmond, there's a local food incubator called um, Hatch Kitchen, where they take food entrepreneurs. Um, like there's a woman in Richmond um, who makes empanadas in Hatch's commercial kitchen and runs a food truck in Richmond. And she'd like to start her own restaurant one day. And so Hatch, Hatch services entrepreneurs like, like this woman, um, and we were able to, um, we just announced last week that the ground floor of this building that we've invested in in Richmond is going to be a food hall and local market in a neighborhood that's an opportunity zone. It's a food desert. At the same time, there is some growth. And so there's, there's employment opportunities, job creation opportunities for these local entrepreneurs. Now, if you went to a, um, if you went to the lender who had considered the project pre-COVID a Food hall for local entrepreneurs is just not what lenders are used to underwriting. I think it's I think it's unlikely that that plan would have gone forward. But replacing that with opportunity zone equity that's very patient and mission oriented um, is is very exciting. So again, I, I think it's been um, there have been a lot of challenges, but, you know, but for opportunity zone capital and but for rethinking things post COVID, um, this 
local food entrepreneur employment opportunity in Richmond probably probably wouldn't have happened. So I think we're I think we're very excited in some ways that that a lot of uh, the deck has been reshuffled in a lot of in a lot of different projects. Um, it, it it it's tough out there, but there there are opportunities that weren't weren't there a year ago. Great, thanks, Ross. Um, I think we're going to try to uh, stop this about twelve fifteen. So we've you know maybe uh, seven eight minutes left. Uh, no, let's go to a question that um, uh, Ross alluded to, which is you know much of the opportunities on discussions focused on uh, investing in commercial real estate. Uh, but there's also legislation that allows for equity investments in businesses. And so can you just maybe talk to us a little bit about, you know, how does that work? Um, it's certainly something of, of interest. As Ross noted, it was maybe a little bit complicated before COVID and maybe more complicated uh, post COVID, but um, share with us a little bit of your thoughts about that. Sure. So um, when Wood Forest first became involved in the Opportunity Zone space back in uh, 2019, really, there wasn't much regulatory clarity around the operating business piece. I think we saw a lot of activity um, move to commercial real estate. We were more comfortable there, just given the IRS um, guidelines. Um, and, you know, there also was a lot of movement into major metropolitan areas. So we were very intentional in our first fund to focus on rural communities. Um, but we still felt that the work that we had done wasn't having, um, it wasn't fully encompassing what the Opportunity Zone program was intended to do. Uh, the commercial real estate piece is excellent and can have great impact, but the act was also written to foster investment into operating businesses. Um, so there was some um, uh, updates that came out from the IRS that made it much easier in our opinion uh, and much clearer on how to invest in operating businesses in Opportunity Zones. One of those is that um, now assets can be sold before the 10 year uh, term if they're reinvested in another qualifying business within one year. So, you know, holding uh, a, an investment until the 10 years is important to get the tax benefits, um, but sometimes that might be not be the most advantageous um, path for the business and or the investor. So now there's a bit more added flexibility in that. Also, uh, in terms of qualifying a business, um, there was more clarity around, you know, 50% of the company's total hours worked had to be by employees or independent contractors within an opportunity zone or total, total dollars paid to employees and independent contractors for services performed within an opportunity zone must be at least 50% of the company's total dollars paid. So, um, and then the last one is around revenue. So both the management or operational staff and the tangible property of the business that is in an opportunity zone must be necessary to generate 50% of the co company's gross income. So there's sort of several ways that you can get at that 50% test. Um, so having that clarity, we are thrilled to be partnering with um, Altura Economic Opportunity Fund. This is a fund that's led by Monica Mantia. Um, she has a background in the SBIC space through a fund called Small Business Community Capital. And her team is really repurposing their skill set from the SBIC world to invest in operating businesses and opportunity zones. And their focus is really on female um, and minority led firms. Um, and so part of their value add is Monica sits on the billion dollar round table and they're really connecting companies that are primed for growth with major corporations looking to improve their um, procurement practices and improve supplier diversity. So um, we think there's a lot of promise there, especially if we're looking at where has capital not historically flowed and looking at some of the, you know, percentages around female and, and diverse led companies. Great, thank you. Uh, maybe in the, the last few minutes we have remaining, uh, each of you can take a shot at, at answering this and giving some feedback from our communities. Um, sometimes communities may have a, a project or an idea in mind that may or may not be the best fit for Opportunity Zone funding. So can you talk to us a little bit about what are the considerations that um, communities need to have in mind when they're thinking about developing a project from an investor perspective? Uh, what are maybe some of the places where the investors and the communities have uh, different visions for a project and perhaps uh, communities need to maybe reposition themselves to be 
in a better position to get in front of investors and, and have an investable project. So Ross, why don't you take the shot at that first, then uh, Noel, you can conclude uh, our fireside chat with your response. Yeah, you know, I think one of the biggest um, benefits of the Opportunity Zone program is, is not the tax incentive itself, but the way it's actually, I think, rekindled a lot of conversation in the country around people um, interested in investing in distressed communities. It's brought a bunch of new, new capital to the table. Um, so I think a lot of the, the first bit of advice I would give is trying to figure out how to translate your work on the ground to how... Um, the, the, the boxes that investors like to, to think in and, and fit in. And I think translation needs to go both ways. Investors also need to have a better understanding of, of, of how communities operate on the ground. So for example, um, we have a partnership with LISC, the largest community development financial institution in the country. Um, what we know is equity investment into real estate and businesses. Um, we, are, we are not community organizers that we know that it's important for the work to be done. Um, LISC wrote in many cases, um, the community plans and the communities where we are investing and has had an on the ground office for 10 years and, and understanding both sides of that is true. So it, it is really important. So for example, if you have a um, very, very cool hotel, cafe, coffee shop, um, understand what an investor looks for when they make a hospitality or commercial or mixed use investment. Um, if you're trying to build, um, if you're a city like Huntsville or Greenville or Charlottesville, which is fortunate to be growing and has an affordable housing, Crisis, understand who's investing in, in workforce housing is a phrase that investors use a lot. Um, under, understand how to be bilingual and on the ground speak and investor speak. And I think some of the work that Noel and Alex and, and we are trying to do is help investors have a better understanding of, of community speak as well. I think I think both sides need to understand each other better. But you know, investors don't invest in projects. They invest in categories and assets. So figure out what is out there like what you're doing, even though what you're doing is unique. Um, because um, because if you help translate into, this is a workforce multifamily in Western North Carolina, or this is a commercial development in Northern Alabama, people people will, will understand the right expectation. Great, thank you. Noel? Yeah, I think that, that's exactly right. And um... For us, you know, it is helpful. We heard in some of the earlier presentations how to put together a pitch deck that includes a performa with sources and uses and a concise impact thesis of the project. Um, is it in line with community needs? Are there letters of support that demonstrate that? Um, is there a market demand analysis? So for me, that you know, that could feel overwhelming, um, but I think it's great to hear about organizations like Opportunity Appalachia that are able to provide that technical assistance. And of course, we've worked a lot with Alex at Opportunity Alabama. I think, you know, leverage those resources. And I know there's a lot of um, public and, and nonprofit uh, representation on the line. If you want to know how to get involved in the Opportunity Zone space, I think those convening entities that can help people sort of package things. And like Ross said, do a lot of that translation between the community and the investors. That's a great asset to have. Um, so just really appreciate all the work of, of those sort of market makers. Um, but also, we as impact investors are also looking at um, the Opportunity Zone Impact Reporting Framework that was put together by the Beck Center at Georgetown, uh, the U.S. Impact Investing Alliance, and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And in that, we're really looking at each investment. Yes, of course, that it's a sound financial return, but also is it in line with community-defined needs? Will it provide um, social equity? Uh, what is the transparency of ongoing reporting and impact measurement? So I think um, don't, don't assume that because an investor is an investor, they only want to talk about the financial side. I think having that really clean story um, and clear story about how different um, community entities have come together to realize this vision is as important for, for many of the investors in this space. Great. Well, thanks to both of you. This is a lot of information that we packed in a very short uh, window. And uh, I know that there are some questions out there. Uh, right now, I'd like to ask that um, that all the presenters unmute their mics and turn on their videos for the Q&A. And I'm going to turn it back over to Jennifer Simon to lead us uh, in a question and answer session. Uh, and thanks again, uh, Noel and Ross. Uh, it was a real pleasure working with you as we prepare for this panel and uh, appreciate having the opportunity to be with you today. Jennifer. Thank, Thank you. you, Jason. I appreciate you uh, running this this panel. And I just 
I want to recognize that um, these are some of the top leaders in the Opportunity Zone space. And while I did their introductions, um, you know, two of them, at least two of them, have made the Forbes uh, top 20 uh, Opportunity Zone catalyst list. And, and that's Donna Gambrell with Opportunity Appalachia. And of course, um, Alex with um, with Opportunity Alabama. And so I, I encourage you to look that up. Maybe we'll drop a, a link to the story in, in the chat. Um, so I wanna move into our into our questions. And some of these you may have, have touched on, but I, I just would like us to, being mindful of time, uh, be able to, to go into them. And I just wanna remind everybody, if we don't get to all of the questions, we will do our best to put in additional information on um, the Opportunity Zones page on um, uh, ARC's website, arc.gov. So, um, so this one I think could go um, probably more to Peter. We, we were asked about um, whether an Opportunity Zone has to have an organizational entity or a board who's responsible for overseeing this, this work. So if you'd like to, to take that one. Yeah, sure. I can uh, answer quickly. And then I'm sure some of the other folks who are involved in helping to organize some of the community responses uh, might chime in. The short answer is uh, no, there's not a mandate for this to be in place. Like every census tract with the nominated opportunity zone doesn't have an explicitly defined sort of lead organization. Um, oftentimes what we see instead is um, organizations that are otherwise involved in community and economic development work in that space, sort of stepping into that, into that uh, role and saying, hey, you know, we'll, we recognize that this is an important opportunity for our community. We think there is benefit to be had from engaging in this opportunity zone space. We will sort of assume some of that leadership position to um, help mobilize a community effort in response. So that typically looks like either, you know, community nonprofits, um, sometimes a city, and a county, or other sort of public sector community economic development teams, um, you know, all the way up to regional and state teams, um, depending on the, the local context. Occasionally we see local philanthropic organizations either leading or helping to um, uh, support organizations who are leading, uh, chambers of commerce occasionally too. So there's some examples of teams that have stepped into that role, but they're not necessarily designated or uh, mandated to be playing that role. Great, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, this is for uh, the investors. So are, how do best investors actually make money on their your investments or is it really just about limiting the impact of capital gains? So I would say that um, the Opportunity Zone Incentive will not make a bad investment a good investment. So investors are going to look first, does this investment make sense? To us, you know, the tax, in, tax incentive um, is helpful in that it's making people look at projects or companies that perhaps they wouldn't in the past. And I can name several examples, uh, and I think Ross even did, of projects that would not have come to fruition if not for the Opportunity Zone incentive. Um, but at the end of the day, an investor is also going to want to see that it will have a, a strong IRR over the 10-year period. And for impact investors like Wood Forest and Blueprint, um, we are also going to want to see the impact. Great. Thank you. I don't know, Ross, if you want to add to that uh, anything or, or if... Uh... Yeah, I would say I would say I have seen a lot of um, presentations where people talk about projected returns and they put the opportunity zone incentive into projected returns. I, I haven't seen investors really go to that. I think investors look at the fundamental um, viability of the project and look at the opportunity zone incentive as a extra incentive is to, to get the project over the finish line. But I, 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 think, um, I, think, I think the deal has to fundamentally make sense. I think unlike other pr projects, which are programs which are grant based or subsidy based, I, I, I echo Noel, it's, it's not going to turn a, a project that's not viable into a good one. I do think as a marketing vehicle for people to pay attention to your community where they otherwise might not have been interested in Bristol, Virginia, or just to, just to cite an example, um, it, it can be really effective. But yeah, we think of it more of a, as a vehicle to attract and focus attention than a vehicle to turn non-viable projects into viable ones. All right, thank you for that. Um, this question is sort of about two different sectors and how you might get opportunities zones to build on uh, uh, those 
sector. One is around manufacturing businesses and, and how they can um, uh, attract uh, OZ funds. And then the second is about PACE energy financing and, and having um, uh, PACE energy financing as part of any of the capital stacks that align with opportunity zones. Just out there for anybody who wants to take it uh, on the uh, manufacturing business side, maybe um, uh, Noel, you might want to maybe uh, tackle that. You, you've you've talked about the businesses and 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 the uh, funding. Is there are people looking at manufacturing businesses? Is there a way for those businesses maybe to make a stronger case? Um, Ross, you also talked about some sector. Uh, investment that is happening, um, you know, wh what do you all see in, in, in those uh, arenas? One thing I've seen that has, I, I, I would say I've been somewhat disappointed so far as the, by the amount of capital that has gone to businesses. Um, the businesses that have been successful raising money, though, um, are ones that have physical assets that people can understand. So, for example, I have seen a few examples where a manufacturing business will own its property and in order to raise additional cash, they will sell the property to an opportunity zone fund. They will lease the property back to themselves as a business with a goal of purchasing the property outright after 10 years. So I would say, um, you know, compared to technology businesses that don't have a lot of physical inventory, probably don't own land. I think manufacturing businesses are, are well set up to raise money. I would say um, there's there's a question around investors liking land as collateral. I would say if you have if you have land, you can use that to finance your business, um, which is which is something that I think has been effective um, and, and 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 is extremely interesting to, to to certain opportunities and investors who want to hold land as a hedge against other other types of things that happen in the market. Great. Yeah, and I would just add that the Altura fund that I mentioned that is focused on operating businesses, manufacturing is one of the prioritized sectors. Um, and there's different situations where an investment in manufacturing firm would be considered if they're looking for growth capital or there's ownership shifts or acquisition, refinancing, recapitalization. But really the financial metrics that we're looking at uh, in terms of size um, and, and previous successes uh, revenues between 5 million and 100 million and EBITDA between 1 and 10 million. Um, so, you know, also low loan to value. So it's not necessarily a, good, a strong fit for all manufacturing firms, but it definitely is one of the, the sectors that we're looking into. Great. Thank you for that. So, though, so I think this is likely the last question because we want to stay on time. Um, as the Opportunity Zone um, program matures, you know, is there a likelihood that there will be a supply and demand in, imbalance, meaning there'll be more dollars out there um, than projects? Is is that a potential? And you know, that's asking to look into the you know uh, into the future in a, a way that might be difficult. But um, what are y'all seeing on, on on that end? And do you think that that could be a reality? Well, Jen, I'm not, I'm not the expert and I can't uh, see into that crystal ball. I can tell you this, I, I think the demand is so great out there in so many of the communities across this country, whether they're in urban markets or rural markets. Um, and, and it's interesting because when I was at the CDFI fund, there was similar speculation about new markets tax credits. Uh, you know, what, would we get to a point where there would be more credit allocations than there ever could be um, projects themselves? And we certainly have not seen that. Uh, we continue to see clearly that there's even greater demand for new markets tax credit, the allocations, the projects that um, qualify for allocations, and in particularly in distressed areas, highly distressed areas. So. Um, like I said, I can't be the soothsayer, but uh, and I'd be certainly interested in hearing what my other panelists uh, think as well. But at this early stage, I think it's hard to say. And certainly we have continued to see just high demand for a lot of um, extraordinary beneficial projects for the community and, and opportunity zone space. 
I would say, Jen, that from a, from a LP perspective, you know, having sophisticated fund managers entering the opportunity zone space, um, like Ross and the others we mentioned that are really tackling how do we create multi-investor, multi-asset funds and leverage more capital, um, that, that gives me hope on the continued invest, uh, interest from the investor side. And then I think um, similarly on the project side, hearing from folks like Donna and Alex and Peter who are really providing that technical assistance and arming communities with the resources they need. Um, and ARC, you know, through this webinar to say, this is how communities have been successful at attracting opportunity zone capital and, you know, sharing uh, models and templates so that we can replicate those successes. Um, I, I think those are both critical pieces to really align that supply and demand as we go forward and the industry matures. Well, thank you for that, Noel. I think that's all the, the time that we have today. Um, I want to thank, again, our stellar panel of, of speakers. Uh, I think this has been an incredible uh, webinar and an opportunity for all of us to learn more. I'd like to thank uh, some of the ARC staff, uh, the communications office, for example, uh, Wendy, Chris, and IT folks, John, um, you've been remarkable to work with, so thank you for that and uh, other partners that are across the federal government. So, you know, we've talked to SBA and EDA and, and others. So um, thank you all. And, and as I mentioned, we'll provide more resources based on the, the questions that we were not able to get to today uh, and look for the slides and the video to, to come soon. So thanks again. Thank you.